on Four Lane Road in Bangkok. And the guy in front of me slowed down to a crawl all of a sudden. So I almost turned my wheel right to pass him when a horn blast from behind knocked me back from reacting and I avoided collision with a speeding truck. This whole incident isn't just an illustration of what we know as legendary Bangkok driving. Okay, the guy in front of me, it was normal. He was turning left from two lanes across. The truck driver, he was over speeding, he was probably on speed. Typical. But I, I was thinking about photographs. So what happened was um, I had something called inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness is when you're awake and your eyes are wide open, but your mind is elsewhere and you're not paying attention, really. Paying attention is a crucial skill, not just for Bangkok motorists who want to stay alive, right? But also for photographers, very important. We have to pay attention because the light changes. Because people go about their daily lives with astonishing speed, faster than it takes to change camera settings, and quicker than the myriad of design decisions that we have to make when we take a photograph. Most photographs happen in a burst of a second. And if we're not really paying attention, we might never get the moment right. So we try to catch it when we can. Annie Dillard, in her beautiful book, Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek, talks about a frog she saw on one of her walks at the creek. She said, one moment the frog was a croaking, puffing hole sitting on a log, half submerged in water. And the next moment, she saw it as a sagging bag of skin. She saw the frog deflate. Yes, it deflated. What happened was a giant water bug had bitten the frog and the toxin in its bite had turned the frog's flesh and bone to mush, which the water bug promptly sucked out as a liquid lunch. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that Dillard's curiosity and attentiveness produced a work that is so tangible. When you read her book, it's like you're there. And that's the challenge that a photographer takes when we, uh, when we take photographs, and it necessitates attentiveness. <clears throat> I can take the photograph, and I can really enjoy it, but I have to be able to pay close attention so that I can take you there with me to see what I see. This empathy between the photographer and the viewer isn't the only exchange that a photographer is responsible for. We also have to cultivate an empathy with our subject. You've heard the phrase used before that a portrait is a study of a person. Have you heard that before? Yeah? Well, maybe, because study is attentive scrutiny, maybe when we make a portrait, we're not just posing and preparing a person in front of a studio setting. But what I'd like to suggest is that we study the people we photograph like we study the people we love. We pay attention to what they do. We seek facets of their personality, what their likes and dislikes are. We respect them for their dissimilarities to ourselves, and we allow them to be themselves. These, these considerations make a photograph a transaction of meaning. It's the meaning of a subject's expression and pose in the context of their environment, but it's also the meaning that I present to you when I show you the photograph. Here, see. See what I mean. I remember um, I was a, a college student back in the days before digital cameras, and I was reading Nietzsche's essay on the uses and disadvantages of history for life at the beach. It wasn't really my first choice for reading at the beach. <laughs> it was a requirement, and I struggled through it. Nietzsche says in his essay, it is a matter for wonder, a moment here and then gone. Nothing before it has happened and nothing after it has gone. He thought about the cows in the field, fettered to the moment and its pleasures or displeasures, thus neither melancholy nor bored. At 17, I really had no idea what this meant. I thought Nietzsche had great word choice and syntax, but how it related to me, ne no nada. Until one morning at the beach, I took a walk, a welcome break from 19th century philosophy, and I met Julius. Julius was freckled, and he was serious, and he was delightfully shorter than me. <laughs> and Julius was carrying a blown up plastic boat, trudging along. I asked him, where are you going? And he said, to the pool. 
I looked at the pool about 300 meters away, and I looked at Julius, little Julius, uh, struggling with the blown up plastic boat, so I offered to help him. He said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, well, this is what Julius said. If I look at the pool, I know it's far, so it's heavy. But if I look at my feet walking, it's not far, so it's not heavy. I thought it was brilliant. You know, to be fettered to the moment, to journey, rather than to think only of arrival. That was key. Whatever we pay attention to, it shapes our reality because what's real to us here and now is an interpretation rather than merely what we see. If you're a painter, you know, you can work backwards. You can think of the whole painting that you want to end up with, then you paint. Afterwards, everything in the painting is exactly what you had decided. It's total control. But you know, in photography, you can't really direct anything. You think you can in a studio setting, but you still have to deal with how the model interprets your concept. When we're out in the field photographing, we have to design an image with whatever we find. We have to work with weather. We've got to work with people doing their own thing and ignoring us, good light or flat light, a host of serendipitous events. So what do we do as creatures who want to create order out of chaos? Here's what we do. We move around. Sometimes we lie down on the floor. That's why I wear scarves. Um, we look for patterns. We look for lines. We look for values of light and dark. We look for color, motion, expression, and gesture. We look for a moment when everything seems to fall into place, and then we click. It's a process that leads to a product, maybe, but we do it again and again. To be fettered to the moment, you can't really think about it other than what it is. And you can only live one moment at a time. The things that we photograph are in a constant state of change. Okay? The light is never the same two days in a row in any given place. And people, no matter how creatures of habit they are, they always walk a different way or they always meet different people and then they interact. Human behavior is just beautiful in its endless variation. And the photographer is a student of change, right? What we photograph is a flow of consciousness. It's how we think as we are working with the camera. And it's a, as a student of change, even though everything is whirling around you in a state of chaos, you just have to go with the flow. Flow is what Sixth Mihaly called an optimum state of concentration and attentiveness. He said that when people are in a state of flow, they have mastered how to filter their consciousness. Being able to filter your consciousness means being able at will to decide what's important, even though there are thousands of stimuli bombarding you. It's being able to see this light on this wheelchair at the airport, even though there is a lady walking with her 20 bags, and there's traffic noise and a man yelling about ice cream. But it's this light on this chair is all there is right now. My musician friend David tells me about how it is for him when he's in flow. He says, playing with really good musicians, he no longer hears his guitar. It's been eclipsed by the harmonious interplay of all of the other instruments around him. In photography, it's almost like you have to think with your fingers, but it's not really a reactionary action because you have to make a lot of design decisions when you're taking pictures. Your awareness, though, has to be pure. Your awareness has to be purely on the task at hand, nothing more. You are fettered to the moment, and nothing before it bothers you, and nothing after it brings worry to your heart. Making music or creating images in a bubble is, is so delicate that at any moment it could burst. You know, I can really enjoy taking photographs, but when I look at my watch, or if I think of the laundry pile at home, 
or if I, even if I think, hey, I'm in flow, then everything falls out of sync and it's devoid of passion and it's not fun. Sixet Mihaly says that the brain can get in its own way. If you interrupt a moment of concentration and attentiveness with an unrelated thought, you not only cut off awareness, but you also stop having fun. And you know, anything can be fun. When I tell my friends that I'm waking up at 3 a.m. on a Saturday so that I can drive 150 kilometers to take pictures of vendors in boats, they tell me I'm crazy, <laughs> right? There's a lot of people like me. I know a lady who loves solving mathematical problems. She loves puzzles. Total nerd. I have another friend whose face just positively radiates light when she's helping people at a nursing home. And yet another friend wakes up every day and you know his goal is, I'm gonna make as many people laugh today as I can. If we're open to our present and we're attentive to our passion, giving ourselves an opportunity to engage in a task at hand, we find more enjoyment in our lives. When I was in high school, right about the time that Six Cent Mihalia was coining the term flow, right? I painted every night. After chores and homework, when everybody was settling in to go to sleep, I would lay out my watercolors in a fresh sheet of paper and I would lose myself in a painting. It was so deliciously enjoyable that it didn't matter what I painted, anything would do. It was enjoyable that hours would seem like minutes. And it was so deliciously enjoyable that it didn't matter senior year when an art teacher told me, your technique is horrible, you will never be an artist. I painted anyway. How can you tell a kid that she can't do something which makes her feel free and complete? What we learn from other people perhaps is technique. We can learn technique from others. But what we have to learn on our own is to pay attention. We have to learn to empathize with other people, to trust process rather than to obsess about results, and to have fun. Because the untutored eye can spot beauty, there is a space that we can share in the context of what we create. How many times have you been moved by a song? Anybody? Many times. Yeah, we don't all know the calculus of music or how a symphony works, but we all have been moved by a song. You know, I think over 50% of opera goers don't really understand Italian. I'm one of those 50%, but I go often. And, um, but you know, when, when Amanazzaro and, and Verdi's Aida holds up his chained hands and begins to sing, I bet you that non-Italian non speakers' hearts are also fluttering with emotion because they have been moved by the song. Human beings understand beauty. We understand that, that beauty contains something essential and intimate. When, two th when we see a scene, like what I'm looking at you now, right? We don't really see the entire scene. What the eye does is that it moves in these tiny eye movements called saccades, several times per second. And it records little bits of the scene and sends them to the brain. It's when the signals go to the brain that they become connected and we make meaning. It's recognition when we really, really see. Because it's when the photographer, when we see that what we have captured is not just a happy accident of light and subject, but it's actually a story. It's a narrative of humanity. It's a narrative of something essential and intimate within ourselves. We recognize ourselves in a character in a book, or a song, or a photograph. And really, where does all this imagery come from? You know, why, when you have 12 different photographers taking pictures of the same scene, you come away with a dozen different photographs? You know, I have to confess that this question is a lot more complex than my own simple philosophy. But I do know this, that all of us have the capacity to be original because all of us are trying to demystify our world. Schopenhauer said, the world is my idea, and the world is your idea. If you are a poet, the world is perhaps lines and line breaks, how to phrase reality. 
If you're a philosopher, the world is a question out of which you must wrestle an answer. And if you're a photographer, perhaps the world is an insight which you can share. Terima kasih.